Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for spending your morning here. Um, I'm Joanne. Uh, we're organizing the... So we're organizing the Luminary Lit exhibition, which is going on at level three. And because it's as part of Luminary Lit, I wanted to feature some of the topics that are in the exhibition. So those of you who haven't yet seen it, I warmly invite you to come up after this to level three, because it gives a historical perspective of the church. Um, so first, let me introduce my very distinguished panel. On my right, I have, of course, as I could see, everyone was wanting to take photographs with the both of them. <laughs> Father Aro. Welcome, Father Aro, <laughs> who is going to talk about the history of the MEP. Okay, and over here, of course, Father Vaz, who is a diocesan priest. How many, your sacerdotal you just celebrated with? 50th, congratulations. That's a lot of years. <laughs> Okay, and then over on my left, I have uh, Wendy Lewis. Wendy, she holds, she's held so many hats. Uh, she used, she's currently now the chairperson of a newly set up, I didn't even know this was in, a, in existence, it's really new. It's called the Catholic Healthcare Asia. But previously, she was also heading the Singapore Pastoral Institute. ACCS, which is the Archdiocese Catholic Commission for Schools. Did I get it right? We all love acronyms here. And then also she was in charge of the Federation of Asia. So, okay, what was it? Office of Laity. Office of Laity, sorry. Uh, Federation of Asian Bishops Conference. That sounds like a very big job. <laughs> and then on my further left is um, Mr. Arthur Goh. Arthur has been engaged in pastoral education work since 1999, and he's currently the academic director of uh, CTIS, which is the Catholic Theological Institute of Singapore. And he, he teaches Vatican II Council history, so they are the perfect people to go through with Father Vaz on the Vatican II Council. Yeah, so without further ado, let me please let Father Aru begin with MEP history. Thank you, Father. Thank you. All right, we go on. Yes. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. Good morning, Father. When I was a young priest and was able to walk by myself, <laughs> should I give a talk or recollection? I was asked often. Are you a Redemptorist? No. Are you a Jesuit? No. Are you a Franciscan? No. So who are you? <laughs> and my answer was very simple. Order of Saint Peter. <laughs> I'm a diocesan priest at the service of the church in Singapore. I belong for technical question, training, and so forth to a missionary society, the Paris Foreign Mission Society, to make it short, MEP, which are the seagull in French, which has been founded in 1658 nearly 400 years ago, 1558, when three French bishops were selected by the congregation for the sharing of the gospel in Rome to bring the good news to Asia with a specific priority to train a local diocesan clergy. It was felt at that time you had various religious orders who were sending people in Asia, but there was no 
local diocesan clergy. And he was felt that the church would never grow unless there was diocesan priest and diocesan bishop from the country itself. And so these three priests, these three bishops, were sent to Asia, two for Vietnam and one for China. They left France, the first one in 1660, and reached Thailand after 20 months of the trip across countries, not by sea, because at that time, sea was controlled by the king of Portugal. And so they wanted this bishop to be free from the power of the king of Portugal, and so they told them to travel by land, 20 months. And they reached what was the capital of Thailand, or Siam at that time, Ayutthaya. And they could not go further than that because there was a persecution going on. So at that time, Thailand was very peaceful, very welcoming for foreigners, and they established themselves in Ayutthaya. In 1662, and by 1668, they had already a seminary in Ayutthaya for the training of local priests. Waiting for an opportunity to go to Vietnam or to go to China. They were there peacefully for a number of years, and then there was a persecution against the church by the tide and by the Burmese. As a result, two small Christian communities of the west coast of Thailand, around Phuket today, he was called John Selang at that time, you know, slowly moved from Thailand to Penang. Penang had become British colony. There was peace, tolerance, and they established themselves in two points in the island of Penang, where you have still now the Church of the Assumption and the Church in Puloticus, the Church of the Immaculate Conception. And that's how some of the MEP father from Thailand went to Penang together with the Christian community and to look after them. And the seminary, which was in Ayutthaya, was also destroyed by the persecution. They tried to find a new place in uh, Cambodia and then in India, but it was not suitable. And finally, they established themselves in Penang in 1809. And the seminary is still in Pinan today, operating for the three dioceses of West Malaysia. That seminary was, of course, the priority of the MEP fathers, and it was called the College General because it was open to all the mission of Asia. And in fact, he has trained priests from Japan, Korea, China, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Cambodia. When I was sent there in 1960, there were seminarians from Burma, from Cambodia, from Laos, and from Thailand. Now is a regional seminary for West Malaysia, but still, is a 
basic idea of the MEP training of the local clergy. So, Singapore, 1819. We are told there were about 40 families in those days. 1821, <coughs> we are told that there were already 5,000 people in Singapore. And the Bishop of Thailand began to be worried. And he said, what's happening? I hear about Singapore. I don't know what's happening. Are there any Catholic in Singapore? Am I responsible for them because I have the nearby bishop? And he asked one priest who was teaching in the seminary in Penang and who was on his way to China, stop over in Singapore, have a look, are there any Catholic? And that priest stopped over here in 1821 and said, there are 12 Catholic in Singapore, but they are so busy doing business that they don't care for their souls. Is there the same problem today? I don't know. <laughs> and the priest say, look, uh, for the time being, there is no need of having a priest in Singapore. Just send someone from time to time, a priest to see them. By 1824, already Singapore people, the few Christians which were increasing in number because people were coming to Singapore, were asking for a priest permanently. And in 1833, one priest came to Singapore in a permanent way, and that was Father Corvesi. Father Corvesi, who later on became a bishop, came to Singapore and uh, bought a piece of land and built a chapel for about 700 people where you have the old St. Joseph institution. The chapel which is still existing there is the one which succeeded the first chapel built around 1835. And from there, the church grew in Singapore. So the church in Singapore today is the outcome of the church in Thailand, first, in Malaysia, second, and finally, Singapore. And we were part of Malaysia as a church until 1973, which means only 50 years ago did we see here the link with Malaysia. Archbishop also Mendy was for a time Archbishop for Malacca, Singapore. And 1973, the church, well, they established the diocese of Malacca, Johor. So we must remember that link with the Church of Malaysia. And while the Church was growing in Singapore, the Church was growing in Malaysia. In Singapore, the number of Catholics grew. There were quite a number of conversions. They established an outreach in Bukitima, especially for the Chinese farmer who were growing pepper and gambier there. And uh, slowly, the chapel became too small and they petitioned the government and we were given the land on which we are now. That land was given by the government and the men who took over the direction of the church in Singapore is Father Burrell. Father Burrell came in 1839 and remained here until 1870. 
69 for 30 years, and he was the foundation stone of the church in Singapore as far as the priests were concerned. He's the one who started building the church and the church of the Good Shepherd was blessed in 1847. But Father Burrell, looking at grassroots level, understood the need of the church in Singapore, especially in the line of education. He started on his own some school. The first one at the place where you have St. Joseph now. And uh, he tried to get some people who were in education. And finally, he went back to France and came back in 1952, in 1852, bringing with him the Aigenans and the De La Salle brothers. The De La Salle brothers established themselves immediately in Singapore. The Aigenans for a time went to Penang. Another group came in 1854, and we have St. Joseph here and CHIG, which is Chimes now, the other side. And so you have the church growing. At the same time, services were going on in church, in Malay, English, Chinese, and uh, uh, Tamil, four languages. Of course, that was not very practical. And as soon as we got some money, it was decided to divide the churches. In 1841, Singapore and Malaysia was made by Rome a diocese on his own. They were roughly, we are told at that time, 1841, Singapore, 500 Catholic. Penang, 2,200. Malacca, 2,000. Mergui, in Burma, 290. That was enough to begin a new diocese. We in Singapore were growing in number, and so as soon as there was some money, it was decided to build another church, and so you would have English and Malay at the Good Shepherd, and you would have Chinese and Tamil at the Church of Saints Peter and Paul, which was built around 1868-1869. Then, 20 years later, when there was some money, at the end of the same road, they built the Church of Our Lady of Lourdes. So you would have Our Lady of Lourdes for Tamil, St. Peter and Paul for Chinese, Good Shepherd for Malay and English. At that time, Malay was used quite widely for the services. And later on, 1910, was built the Church of the Sacred Heart, where they put Cantonese and K people, while Chu Chu and Hokkien remain in St. Peter and Paul. So, English and Malay Good Shepherd, Chu Chu, Hokkien, St. Peter and Paul, Tamil, Our Lady of Lourdes, and 
que en uh, Cantonese in uh, Sacred Heart Church. Of course, all the priests, except maybe one or two visiting, were uh, missionaries and were MEP priests. By the year 1904, the Catholic population in Singapore was around 10,000. And by 1923, around 12,000. Now, if you ask me, what is a special charism, to use a big word, of the MEP fathers, I would say first, we have pioneering. We go where there is no Christian community, and we start sharing the good news and see what is the response of the people. We are pioneering. As a result, because we are pioneering, what is essential is the learning of local languages. When I came to Singapore in 1957, in the taxi which brought me from Clifford Pier to the Bishop's house here, I was told it has been decided you would learn Chinese. Okay. <laughs> nobody knew me, nobody has ever seen me, but it was decided that I would learn Chinese. Why? Because the two priests before me, one of them is still alive, Father Nicola, would be sent to learn Tamil. So, coming here as missionary, we were separated between Tamil and Chinese. After six months in Holy Family, to practice a bit of English, my English was very poor, I was sent to Kuala Lumpur, where there was a special school to teach Chinese to adult people. And I spent two years there, in that school, five hours a day, six days a week, for two years. Okay, and to make sure that we were doing our work properly, after six months, we started to learn the Chinese character, and every day we used to have ting shi for about one hour in the morning. That was essential. Later on, I pass on many details, we learned a bit of Malay when Malaysia and Singapore were together. We were a group of about 10 or 12 priests learning Malay. And then I was sent to Siglap, where, of course, I learned Peranakan. <laughs> Peranakan language and Peranakan cuisine. Now, this question of language is essential. And among the MEP priests, you had someone who were very well known for the way they were speaking the local languages. One of the early bishops, Le Turdu, wrote a lot of books in Malay translation of prayer, and so forth, you know. And we were happy to be able to show to Malaysia that Malay had been used long ago in the worship of the church. Then, Father Becheras was a specialist for Chuchu, and he is the one who initiated the Catholic high school. Then you had Archbishop Orsomendi, who was fluent in Tamil. You have someone like Father Barto, who was fluent in Cantonese and in Mandarin. Father uh, 
Father Charbonnier was, is very fluent in Mandarin and he's a real Chinese specialist. So this question of being with the people, entering the culture of the people, living with the people, sensing the needs of the people, that is essential in our vision and essential in the question of preparing a clergy, a clergy who would be at the service of the people. They would not be religious who are specialized, but they would be GPs at the service of the people. That is the charism of the MEP. At the same time, I will finish on that. At the same time, we must help the church to grow. And for that, you need land and you need building. And the MEP fathers have been very good first to acquire land. If you look around in Singapore, the church has a lot of land. In fact, one day during a reception, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew introduced Archbishop also Mendy to some people as the biggest land owner in Singapore. <laughs> the Archbishop was not very pleased with that. <laughs> but for Lee Kuan Yew, he was putting together the churches, the school, the hospital, and so forth. And he's sure if you put all that together, it's a lot. The church was a big land owner. You look, now it's separated, but Good Shepherd Convent, Mount Alvernia, and St. Teresa Home, there was a whole piece of land which belonged to the church. Aukang and Pongol, where you have the minor seminary, all that belonged to the church. Boys Town, where you have the church, but Boys Town itself, Girls Town, and so forth, all of that belonged to the diocese, you see. So the first thing, don't be surprised of the property of the church. These MEP fathers, for most of them, were farmers, and they were eager to have land, you know. They knew the importance to have land. Then, the churches. Archbishop also Mendy was not a man to have a very organized and structured plan, but I heard him saying, a parish should not have more than 3,000 Catholics. If you have more than that, you have no time for non-Catholic. And he wanted his vision to be clear, to reach out to non-Catholic. As a result, during his year as a bishop, he built 17 churches. In 1959, Saint Bernadette and Saint Francis Xavier. 1960, Holy Spirit and Saint Michael. 1961, OLPS and Saint Ignatius. 1963, Blessed Sacrament and Saint Vincent de Paul and also St. Anne. 1966, St. Stephen. 1971, St. Mary of the Angel with the Franciscans, and so forth. Then the risen Christ in 71, and St. Francis of Assisi in 74. You see, all these churches have been built with the same idea. Be where the people are. And every time there was a new town, they were trying to get the land 
in order to have a church there. At the beginning, it was easy. Now, the latest churches, we get the land only on a 30 years basis. I don't go into education and so forth. It will be for someone else. Now, the last charism of the MEP is Pasiton. Pasiton. It is the local clergy who must take the direction of the local church. We have been the pioneer. Other people must become the steady direction of the local church. And for us, MEP, we disappear. First, we disappear in number. When I came to Singapore in 57, there were 30 MEP fathers. Now we are seven. And out of seven, we are three, including myself, who refuse to die. <laughs> three who are above 90. So we have no much future for the church, you see. But there is a local clergy, there is a local bishop. They go ahead. And for us, for those who remain and are active, the missionary priority is there, and he send them to what, what we call now the periphery, meaning the group of people who have not been reached by the gospel yet, and who are in need of a special approach. And so the MEP father are getting involved in different apostolate, including ecumenism and uh, interreligious apostolate and family apostolate and so forth, you know, to help the church to grow. Pioneering grassroots level, establishing the church according to the needs of people, and that's the reason why it was at the beginning according to languages, and now offering its services especially for the periphery. That's all I could share. If some of you have questions and so forth, don't hesitate. I just calculated, Father. Mm -hmm. Since 1957, you've been in Singapore. You have to come and speak near <laughs> to my ear. <laughs> that is old age. You've been here since 1957. You've been here since 1957. That's 64 years. Eh? <laughs> you have been. You have been here since 1957. Since 1957. Because the MEP, when we are sent to a church, we are sent for life. Oh. We don't come for three years or a contract of three years or six years, you know. But our mission is outside of France for life. Unless there are reasons to go back to France because of no sickness or we are needed at the headquarters, but normally we are here for life. And that's why we are three retired people here, Father Christophe, Father Nicola, and myself. We are here for life. Thank you, Father. Does anyone have any questions? Basically, Father has been here much longer than I've, I've been alive. <laughs> yes? I will translate. I mean, I will. One by one, first? Okay. There were 12 Malay, there were 12 families here, 12 Catholics. 
Yes. Is there any record of who they were? Were they local? Were they Malays? Well, Malays? it seems that uh, there was a mixture, and there were a few what they call Eurasians, you know, merchants, but from other country. You see, uh, at that time, not knowing where to go, Amber remained on board the ship in the harbor and came to visit around, you know. So they were also, most probably, a few Eurasians from Malacca who had come down to Singapore. But there is no, he gave, he gave one or two names, you know. He said, should the priest go there, stay with Mr. So-and-so, stay with Mr. So-and-so. He gave a few names. There's actually a letter up at the exhibition written by Father Lauren Imbeer, where he says that he was invited to stay. I can't remember the person's name now. Uh, so maybe you can go up and read in detail. The letter was translated from French. This Laurent Ambert who visited here later on went in a mission to Korea and was killed in Korea. He's a martyr and he has been canonized. And we have the relic of Laurent Ambert here in the wall of the cathedral next to the baptismal fund, you know. And the cathedral is called the Good Shepherd because he himself, Amber, when he was arrested by the police in Korea and the persecution was very, very fierce, he felt that he was to surrender to the police to stop the persecution. And he said, to his fellow priest, in extreme cases, the good shepherd give his life for his flock. And Father Burrell was quite impressed by that, and when he built the church here, he called the church the good shepherd. So you can see from the slide, he lived until he was about 43 years old and before he was martyred. Um, yeah, and he was beautified in 1925, canonized in 1984. So that's his history. I didn't know about the relic, but his painting is there. There's a painting of him over there. Mm. Okay, I think, sorry, I, let's, let's, if there's no other questions, I think we should start with the Vatican. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yeah, because we have another part to the, uh, yeah, so thanks for your understanding. Uh, so we have another sec second part, part two, which is aptly Vatican II, uh, and that's Father Vaz area. He's very knowledgeable in that, and we have two others, uh, Wendy as well as Arthur. Um, so I'll hand them over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Joanne. Um, so, uh, listening to Father Aro, we can clearly see the work of the Spirit um, moving uh, the missionaries uh, to come to Singapore, uh, particularly the MEPs. Um, they are pioneering and um, enlivening the local uh, people, uh, the church, uh, uh, the laity, uh, the clergy, and um, the amount of work that they did, yeah, as Father Aro pointed out. Um, and it's very interesting how uh, we can look at the work of the Spirit continuing uh, through the missionaries uh, into the life of the local vis-a-vis uh, -vis the universal church uh, at a point where you see the screen, uh, you have an image of the church today, yeah? With all that uh, is involved in the life of the church today. And that, that uh, diagram there, uh, dear friends, that, that little um, slide that you have, actually is 
the fruit of a lot of uh, experience, uh, the fruit of a lot of uh, life that was led by the people, uh, the fruit of a lot of thinking and reflecting, the fruit of a lot of faith, um, and therefore the fruit, you could say, of a very, very uh, massive uh, 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 experience that the Universal Church had in 1962, and it went on until 1965, in what we know as the Second Vatican Council. Yeah. So today we are speaking of a church in Singapore, not just 200 years old, but a church that's vibrant in Singapore now in the spirit of Vatican II. And um, Joanne uh, asked me um, to share with Father Aro how the church in Singapore uh, has been moving on uh, with the help of the MEP in the first instance. And as Father Aro says, now it is on to the local clergy. It is on uh, to the people, uh, the local people, the Singaporeans, yeah, the local church in Singapore. And that's why I said I have to invite Wendy and uh, Arthur because this is really the spirit of Vatican II, um, that the church is not just priests and religious, but the church is the people of God. And uh, very interestingly, uh, that church uh, is um, able to be vibrant today because of the charisms the Holy Spirit gives um, to everybody in the church. The lay people, the priests, the bishops, the Holy Father himself. And that's why uh, when I look back, dear friends, on uh, the impact of Vatican II, I count myself uh, very fortunate, actually, that um, I began my priestly studies uh, just when the council was beginning. I joined the seminary in 1962. That was the minor seminary. In those days, it was for three years. So 1962, 63, 64, the council was going on. And it was very exciting because uh, every evening, uh, the rector of the seminary would give us an update of what was happening uh, at the council. Mm -hmm. I remember I joined the seminary uh, on the 6th of January, and the council began in October of that year, 1962. And, uh, after a while, reports were beginning to come out of Rome, and the rector would keep us updated. And it was very exciting. 1965, I went to the major seminary in Penang, and um, the council ended uh, in December uh, 1965. And while we were in Penang, we began to feel the effects of Vatican Council. Yeah. So the first thing was uh, the kind of life, the, the, the sort of rules and regulations, the discipline uh, that was in the seminary uh, began to be impacted by the way of Vatican II. So we began to experience a lot of changes. Yeah? Um, uh, a lot of the teaching began to uh, be conducted in the vernacular in English. Um, a lot of emphasis was being uh, placed on our understanding uh, the meaning of church uh, for which we were being trained to be pastors, to work with the people, 
and to look after the people. Uh, the way of life in the seminary began to be impacted, um, not just the question of relaxation of rules and regulations, but with the accent on pastoral attention, uh, the accent on not just learning academics, but to take what we are learning and apply it to the life of the people. Yeah? And it was at that time of our formation that it was slowly but very powerfully being brought to our um, uh, knowledge to be brought to our consideration because we were still in the process of forming, uh, uh, being formed. And so we would have to eventually make uh, a sort of a decision. Uh, do we want to continue uh, being ordained or do we want to leave the seminary and do something else? We had to, we had to make a decision. Why to be ordained? Why to be ordained? And I remember, dear friends, that was really a very, very uh, 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 crucial time in my life and in the life of my confreres in the seminary. Um, and so to, able, to be able to answer that question, we had to fall back on our training, which we noticed was very strongly on the understanding of church as the people of God who are, like Jesus, the light in the world. And therefore, this church, light in the world, has to be relevant to the life of the people the joys, the sorrows, the hopes, and the pains. Uh, Gaudium et spes, yeah? joy and hope. Uh, at the same time, uh, with the pains and sufferings of the people. Now, do you want to be a priest who wants to work with the people in being that light, in being relevant to the pains and sufferings and the joys and the hopes? Do you want to be that kind uh, do you want to live that kind of life? But how are you going to do that? We began to realize the power of the word of God. And in the seminary, there was a very, very heavy insistence on biblical, uh, scriptural formation. We had six years of scripture formation, two years in philosophy and four years in theology. And we began to realize that word of God is going to be uh, what we needed to share with the people to help them to appreciate the person of Jesus, to enter into that relationship with Jesus, who is the light of the world, and to imitate that Jesus. So this was continuously being stressed in our seminary formation. Uh, thanks to Vatican II, yeah? and you can see the impact on that slide, yeah? how it affected um, practically every area of church life. But we were still in formation, so we had, to, we had to kind of put that in our head, that if you want to be a priest, if you are going to say yes, then you've got to be at the service uh, of the people in, in, in every area of the people's lives. But also comes the question, why? Why do you want to do that? And so we had a very good formation in liturgy that our whole life is really to praise God. And praise of God is not just in some ritual, is not just in some devotional, is not in just some pious practice but you really praise God by the way you live life. And so Vatican II uh, helped us to see in the Eucharist, the whole summit of Christian life uh, where we can praise God in the service of our people and how attending Eucharist actually was an action of mission where we were told, uh, where we are continuously being told, go. Go, you are sent forth. Go, glorify God by your life. Go, announce the good news. It's a mission command. It's not just a pious practice, but it's a whole involvement with Jesus. And so you priest, 
I'm sorry, you seminarians, do you want to be that kind of priest? You know? So this was the continuous question. Together with that, dear friends, in the seminary also, because of Vatican II, we began to experience uh, how we were being sent out of the seminary. Every week, we would go to a parish. There would be pastoral work. There would be pastoral attachment. There would be an opportunity to really get involved with people and their issues and their questions and their struggles. And we would have to respond to them. We would have to accompany them. We would have to be with them. It's training, yeah? So when we got back to the seminary after the weekend, there would be a reflection. How did you do? What did you see? How did you say? What did you say? Why did you say? How did everything that you did, how was it in line with Jesus? How is it preparing you for ministry, yeah? So finally, dear friends, in 1971, when I was ordained uh, in uh, February of 71, um, I was really looking forward to ministry in the spirit and the way of Vatican II, you know, because that's the way I was trained. That's the way I was formed. And right from the early days, I remember my first attachment was Holy Family. This is what was exciting, how to be with young people how to be with middle-aged people, how to be with elderly people, how to be with all the people, how to be with children, how to be with families, yeah? So all these became opportunities for me to put into effect what I had been learning uh, in the seminary and that kind of spirit that was driving, no? That I wanted to put into uh, effect in our life. And I remember right from the early days, dear friends, uh, I, I came to realize there was, uh, in the power of the spirit, I'm quite sure, a kind of an energy that was uh, uh, moving in the people. Uh, the thirst for the word of God, for example, the thirst for wanting to know more about the word of God in scripture, uh, 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 the wanting to apply that to life, you know, so that was happening. Uh, the desire of people to want to be involved in the life of the church, the life of Jesus uh, in the world, you know, uh, how to really have meaningful liturgies, how to have uh, celebrations of worship uh, that was really coming from the experience of everyday life. And I remember in my younger days, there was a lot of this kind of effort, you know, to try to do everything, even in praise and worship and liturgy, uh, linked to the life, coming out of the experience of the people. And then we began to see uh, more and more lay people wanting to get involved in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And I think it's at that point how the lay people really got excited and wanted to be part of the church, I'd like to invite Wendy and Arthur to pick it up because they would have been lay people at that time, yeah? And uh, how Vatican II then is a driving power even up to now, dear friends, yeah? Oh, thank you, thank you, Father Vaz. Thank you, Father Aro, for a very interesting uh, history Lots of uh, interesting things in the foundations of the church in Singapore. Um, I'm also going to do a little bit of going back before I come forward. Father Vaz uh, was in minor seminary in 62, and I was in school. Um, and uh, before that, in the primary school, we belonged to the Joyful Vanguard. In the secondary school, I belong to the Young Christian Students Movement. Now, I must say that even before the Second Vatican Council, in the, especially in the European uh, churches, there was a lot of reform movements already taking place. And these movements, like the Young Christian Students and, and Young Christian Workers, they were part of this reform to try and understand what is the real role of the laity. 
at that time. You know? So when I was in school, and it was just the beginning of the uh, Second Vatican Council when I was coming into my teens, um, the important thing was that we were doing good work, but the understanding in the church at the time was that we are an extended arm of the clergy. What I do is actually helping father you know, in the work of the church. So in that sense, it's not my mission, it's father's mission, but I'm helping. That was the way we understood it before Vatican II. So what Vatican II did then, in the movements also, and in these other organizations and ministries, was for us to understand baptism as the source of mission. Baptism was the most important thing, whether you are a lay person, an ordained person, a religious, huh? so baptism as the foundation for mission was one of the teachings of Vatican II very strong. So instead of saying, how can I help Father? Father is now saying, how can I help the people to fulfill our common mission? So very important change in mentality. I'm not the extended arm of the clergy unless I'm an Eucharistic minister. Yeah, so these are the extraordinary ministers considered because the priest is not there, I do it instead of. Okay? So very important change took place. And for me, this was very exciting uh, in the movements. And my, my whole life, I was not an excellent Catholic, let me tell you. I went here, there, and everywhere, and, and came back in a big way. Um, but one of the things I was doing, and I liked to do as a, as a young person, was to sing in the choir. So the other area of big impact that I saw was in the liturgy. I'm a parishioner of St. Ignatius. And before Vatican II, we were singing in a very hot upstairs gallery. You know, like Cathedral also has a gallery at the back, right? But now the choir is not singing there. We were sitting, singing on the right side of the altar, very hot, and only in Latin, all the masses and everything, no? Everything was in Latin. I enjoyed the music because it was good music. But most of the time, nobody really understood. You just had a good feeling. But then when there were changes, they were difficult to make. The choir comes down, is part of leading the congregation in song. So the emphasis of Vatican II was conscious participation. As Father Vaz was saying, Eucharist is for mission. Eucharist is to send you out on mission with, the, with Jesus, no? As your strength. So, with the whole community. So, the concept of Eucharist as a community experience, not just my solo uh, kind of sense of the sacred, no? But community, participation, engagement. So, that was the, the second thing. So, first the movements, in my experience, and then in the liturgy. And then when I joined the pastoral center, the catechetical office first, the big change that I had to keep emphasizing in the courses that we ran for catechists was before Vatican II, if you know the creed, you can say all the things and you know, you, you say, yes, I believe, yes, I believe, yes, I believe. Tick, 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 can baptize already. Now, then came the RCIA, which Arthur may talk about later. So the big change is, now it requires a personal relationship with Christ and a change of lifestyle. That's the demand for baptism. So I think the impact was very strong because I had to keep helping the whole catechetical process. This I joined in 87. Uh, the whole catechetical process, which was already well underway, let me say, I didn't just start anything, um, was this shift of mentality from attending a one-on-one -on -one class, you know, then you tick off all the things that you've done and you came 80% attendance, yes, okay. You know all this, yes, can baptize. 
So that was the, the other change in my catechetical role. And then finally, in my pastoral role, uh, when I joined the Pastoral Institute, by the way, my introduction was so long, Father Vaz's was so short, I felt bad, you know, because he was my boss for years <laughs> in the pastoral center. And I only me. became uh, a part of that under him. So in the pastoral scene, my main work, even though I did many other things, the main vision, the main work was to implement the vision of Vatican II, which had been um, how should I say, adopted fully by the Federation of Asian Bishops' Conferences. And in that Federation of Conferences of Bishops, I worked from 1992, setting up small Christian communities, or NCCs, all over Asia. And I worked for the Office of Laity and Family, uh, Asipa Desk first, and then later I, I was running the whole office. So the whole role of the laity was changing. They had to feel belonging to a community. They had to feel that they were part of the church, and they had an important mission to serve in their own families, in their workplaces, as a community in the neighborhoods, and so on. So really, the, the impact of Vatican II for people who are younger than me, you don't understand that why we are church like this is because of Vatican II. And we are implementing it still. We have a long way to go. Okay, so with that, I pass you to Arthur. Thank you, Wendy. In contrast with uh, my panelists, when Vatican II happened, I did not yet exist. <laughs> I was at most an idea in my parents' head as they were dating during that time. So, uh, you know, as Wendy says, uh, um, if you were born after the council, you would have grown up like me in a Catholicism which was very much already reformed by Vatican II. We would take so many things for granted that we would be able to worship and understand uh, the prayers because they were in English or they were in our uh, language that we understood. We would have an active uh, lay participation in the church. You know? And the fact that you have director of SBI who was a priest, uh, a vicar general of the archdiocese, and then you have a director of SBI who is a woman and a lay person, already a significant stride forward uh, in the participation of the lay faithful. And then you have Blur King number one, who took over as director of the SBI again. So we have, actually, I'm not sure whether it's by divine design that we have three former directors of the Singapore Pastoral Institute here uh, today. And uh, for me, my encounter with uh, Vatican II, uh, as I said, taken very much for granted. Yes, I know the teachings of the Council. Yes, as I was studying theology, we had to read the documents, we had to learn the teachings. But when I began to examine the history of the Council and how they prepared for it, how, they, uh, how the bishops came together to discuss these important matters in the church, in the Council, I began to realize what a great moment of conversion it was for the church. The mentalities, the attitudes that we had previously were reformed and were invited by the Holy Spirit to undergo a kind of a change. Yeah? And one of the biggest uh, inspirations that I took from the council was the vocation of the lay faithful. And I began to understand that my role as a lay person in the church is not so much what I do in church, is not so much what I do 
uh, as I participate in ministry, as I work together with the priests, you know, in their various matters of uh, church work, um, it is more about my life as, uh, you know, a professional out in the world, uh, as a, a husband, you know, as a family maker, as a business person, as a, you know, as an investor of money, you know, as whatever we lay people do on the outside, that is actually what the vocation of the lay faithful uh, is about. It is there that God calls us to show our Catholicism, to show our faith in the decisions that we make, in the lifestyle that we adopt outside. So during my time at SPI also, my, my contribution to trying to receive uh, the teaching of the council was to help uh, people to understand that we have a kind of a double responsibility. Yeah? The first responsibility is to get involved in church because the church needs us. And so we have to take part in ministry, we have to assist uh, the priests, uh, we have to support uh, uh, the, the well-being of the organization, of the institution, of the church. But the second responsibility was much more important, yeah? that of living in the world as a conscientious believer in Christ. And together with that, to understand how we operate out in the world alongside other Christians, what we can share with them, how we can develop our relationship with them, and also together with other believers of the great faiths, how we also can cooperate with them, uh, how we can still try and build the kingdom of God uh, together in our works and in our common good intentions. Yeah? So the council continues to play itself out uh, today. You know, our implementation of Vatican II is not yet perfect. Yeah. One of the great achievements of the Council was collegiality, uh, the understanding that every bishop had also a double responsibility. His vocation was not just to look after a piece of church in the world, yeah, but also to share with the Pope a common responsibility for the global church. And the bishops also began to learn this lesson as they gathered in 1962 for the council. They began to realize that, hey, you know, I also have a voice here in Rome together with the Pope in deciding on important matters of policy for the church. And that brought about a kind of a consciousness of a togetherness, a collegiality. Uh, Pope Francis today is trying to expand that consciousness to bring out uh, another truth that was taught at Vatican II, that the entire body of the faithful is also called to be collegial, although we don't use that word, we use synodal instead. Yeah? That the Holy Spirit, as Wendy says, baptism is our qualification, and baptism enables the Holy Spirit to work through us, to live in us, and to inspire others through us. So when we come together as fellow believers of the, uh, the, fellow, the community of the baptized, we come together, we discern, we share our voices, and we listen to one another, we can know the Father's will with infallible accuracy. Yeah? So the more we get together, pray together, find out what God's intention is for us, we get a better idea of what God wants us to do. Yeah? For this time that we find ourselves in, in this modern uh, era. So, again, uh, you can say with secularism, with uh, you know, this, this allergy to religion that people have now in this modern world, after you have heard Father Aro's uh, sharing today, you will find that the situation was not that much different during his time. It was also a challenge to start a community of believers in his, uh, in his era 
as it is in ours. Yeah? But what it needs is the inspiration of the Spirit. And as long as we avail ourselves to it, it is my own personal belief that uh, we can, yeah, as a community, help the church to grow, help the church to become meaningful to our community here in Singapore. Thanks, Arthur. I think um, when I look at... Okay, I was born after Vatican II. So 1962 to 65, that's like four years of intense debates in, within the... I think there were over 2,000 uh, cardinals, 2,005 cardinals, so they were meeting regularly, bishops. bishops. They were meeting regularly, they were discussing and giving their inputs. And so for me to hear that masses in Latin well, in Latin until what year would it have officially started? To 1964? Yeah, so I would, I'm actually curious to hear from Father Aro because the masses were in Latin pre-1964. You came to Singapore in 1957. Uh, so the question I have, how was that change? How did that change to do the masses then in English impact you? The masses used to be in Latin, and then with Vatican II, around 64, became in English. So your experience of the old and then the struggle to change into the English, uh, what's your experience? When I came to Singapore in 57, I was for six months in Holy Family. Then I went back in 61 also to Holy Family. <coughs> In 57, we were one of the few churches having a mass in the evening. See? All the other churches were having mass in the morning only. And slowly, uh, two or three churches began to have mass in the evening, you know. Caton was one of the first one. And the mass, of course, was in Latin and how to help people to pray and to keep people busy. So with my parish priest, we came to the bright conclusion that the best way was to say the rosary during mass. <laughs> you see, we had nothing better. So we were, the priest will begin in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti, and then I will begin, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and so forth. And the rosary will last probably up to the holy, holy, holy. So that was keeping us busy after that, holy communion, okay. <laughs> and uh, we were at that level, you see. The readings, there was no reading of the word of God. It was in Latin by the priest only. There was no homily except on Sunday. On weekday, no homily. Uh, marriage, practically no homily. Funeral, no homily, you see. And everything was in Latin. And we are at the level of devotion. Because devotion at least was in the language of the people. And so, uh, while uh, benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, devotion to Sacred Heart, uh, Novena, and so forth, you know. And then finally, slowly, we began to read, to read the Word of God. I remember in 1965-66, we were reading the Word of God for daily masses, but that was new. And to help us, we have only the, a Sunday Missal, you know, with a reading, a small book like that for two fifty or three dollars, you know. And we were encouraging people to have that, but we were not fed by the Word of God. They were devotions. You know? So people were going to church, no doubt, you know, but devotion. At the same time, there was a lot of practice of confession. 
my first year in Singapore, Christmas 57, on the 23rd of December, I was in Holy Family with Father Munier. Each of us heard 11 hours of confession. <laughs> and on the 24th, each of us heard 13 hours of confession. Father Munier came at a quarter to 12, opened the door of my confessional and told me, enough, enough, come out from that box <laughs> and come and admire the beautiful hats of our parishioners. <laughs> we used to go to the convent every week for confession. I don't think that the girl would go for confession every week now, you know, not even you. But that was the way. And mass became the center, you know, more and more, and we were able to explain it and so forth. And mass became something celebrated, you see. Now, in the, in the text of today, we have pray that my sacrifice and yours, what was missing was yours. The part of the lady was not there. Now it is there because I need you. If I go to church for a mass at 10 o'clock and nobody comes, what do I do? I go back to sleep. <laughs> I cannot celebrate mass alone unless I am sick or something like that, you know. I need you. Every Sunday you are needed to come together to celebrate the Eucharist. But before, and still for many people, the Mass is a show run by the priest, you know, who is doing his own antiques, you know. <laughs> and you, you try to keep busy as much as you can, or you fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Okay, I think the theologic, hold on, let me, theologically, I just wanted to also ask Father Vaz, with Vatican II, um, were there any mindsets proposed by Vatican II that are still a challenge now to implement in Singapore for the church? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, just like Arthur was saying, actually, the, and what I was trying to share in my little introduction just now, the huge uh, uh, mindset was that the church is actually the people of God. We are all involved. And one of the big uh, uh, accents of Vatican II is communio, uh, the communion, the togetherness. The, uh, we are all a communion for a purpose, and that is mission. Uh, we are, uh, so we are part of the mystery uh, our life with God, and that life we live together, and this togetherness is for the transformation of the world. So really, the role of the lay person, really the role of the lay person, the baptized person, is um, the transformation of the temporal order. So this was huge in Vatican II. Uh, and um, that transformation um, is going to be done at the level of family, community, and society. We spelt out the whole accent of the pastoral of the church, which is family life. Uh, families make up communities. Communities make up society. and. What kind of families, what kind of communities, what kind of societies uh, impacted by the person, spirit, and way of Jesus? So that would really be Vatican II, uh, affecting practically every area of life in the world. So if you look at the 16 documents of Vatican II, uh, they really spell out the impact uh, of the witnessing Christian of the Christ-like disciple in every area of life. And this would be linked to Catholic social teachings very closely? 
Catholic social teaching is coming out of scripture, is coming out from the word of God, is coming from the prophetic ministry uh, of the Old Testament in preparation for the new. And the climax and culmination of that prophetic word, the word, which is Jesus. So in terms of what we now know as the social teaching of the church, we would go back to Pope Leo XIII. Huh? And then all the teaching of the church in terms of what it means to be alive, what it means uh, to be a people, what it means to be a harmony, what it means to be a togetherness, in terms of justice, which is actually not a political idea, but it's really uh, the idea that to everybody, to everybody must be given what is his or her due. In the same way that God loves us, we also must love one another. And in his love, God gives us. In the same way, we must give to people that, no? which is not happening in the world today. And that's why you have so many problems and difficulties, yeah? So, so this is the teaching of the church. And Vatican II put that accent, yeah? And today, very much, Pope Francis is carrying on that the, uh, the real attention of the church uh, is an option for the poor, which is not a political reality, but a theological reality. And Pope Francis, in his latest uh, message on World Day of Poor, uh, uh, brings out a very beautiful reflection uh, that Jesus was the first of the poor, and yeah, and how he laid down his life. And so the social teaching of the church becomes the way in which we live out the spirit of Vatican II today. Thank you, Father. To Wendy or Arthur, you want to add anything? Uh, just to say that, th to answer the question as well, um, in 1988, Pope John Paul II wrote uh, The Lay Faithful of Christ. In that, he pointed out there were two um, errors that they have seen happening after the Second Vatican Council. The first one, was that the concept of uh, working in the church or for the church you know, was, um, I've got it a little bit mixed up, but anyway, there, there were the two errors. The first one is that lay people are trying to become more clerical and clergy are trying to become more lay. So there was a kind of mixing of roles so you had a lot of lay people helping with clerical roles uh, or ministries within the parishes. And seeing that as a kind of a summit of responsibility or participation. So uh, as Pope Paul, uh, John Paul said, it was like the clericalization of the laity and the, the clergy also trying to do what is often the role of the laity in social issues or in whatever. So this was a kind of um, warning. And that, that mentality, I think, still remains in Singapore, that uh, we have this sense that the closer you are to the tabernacle, the holier you are you know, in terms of ministry. So if you are too busy because you're a mother of young children and you don't even have time to go to the toilet, never mind having, uh, going to church, you know, um, that you can't be that holy because, you know, you're not in the church or going to church and doing a lot of ministries. So I think this was, this is one of the things that happened after Vatican II, is that a lot of lay people understood their mission, as Arthur was saying, that, that responsibility to transform the world. You know, and, and Father Vaz just said it. That was a bit lost in people using their precious time mainly for church-related ministries. What Father Garcia calls housekeeping. 
So we're so busy with housekeeping, we got no time left for the real work outside the church. So I think that's a mentality that we still need to overcome. Very interesting. Because, yeah, I guess as they were talking, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, as, as Christians, we have to bring our church values into every aspect. Our family, our work situation, in, in the community at large. Um, yeah, so I, sorry, you had a question. So this uh, MEP Father Father Belarus started the one who brought young Christian students and young Christian workers to Singapore, which really primarily tell the students and the workers that the role in the transformation of society. And I'm one of the beneficiary of the MEP Fathers, member of the young Christian students, and later on young Christian workers. And I particularly like what Father Aru said that about the priests being the, they sense the need of the people and being with the people and uh, going into the periphery. Uh, that reminded me of the late Father Aroksarana, an MEP piece, who actually started the Geylang Catholic Center, reaching out to the periphery, the domestic help at the point in the time, and through the work of the MEP fathers and other priests continues. 25 years later, it was the Geylang Catholic Center Respond to the needs of the migrant workers, domestic help. Really, really wonderful. Yeah. So I, well, those of you who are actually interested in knowing more about the work of Father Belarus in the apostolate of the YCS, the YSW, actually there's a book in a bookshop at the Daughters and Paul's uh, called To Jurong We Love. It's a, so at a special price at $10. <laughs> you can get it and you can understand a bit more. I just wish, wish to say a last word of thanks to Joanne and the team. I have gone to the exhibition around. Tremendous amount of work they put in, and it's very enlightening. And all the volunteers I see these past few days, I'm coming around. Uh, I think they deserve a great a round of applause for all the hard work to help us understand the history and all that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hans. Um, yeah, actually, Hans, uh, when he also, this book, To Jurong with Love, I read through it. It was wonderful because I grew up in the 70s and I kind of missed all this. So even when uh, Wendy was sharing about Joyful Vanguard, I didn't know it of its existence. Was it for primary school kids? Yeah, so in my school, I went to a mission school, but I never had that opportunity to join such, you know, uh, united and, 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 yeah, based on the Catholic values. So. Hopefully, like, I mean, I don't know what the changes, maybe these are the changes that came and then went off, but there might be other ways now for our mission schools to reintroduce these aspects because it's really about the dignity of the individual. And I think a lot of the, the, the 1970s, 80s, there was a lot of work help, uh, help rendered by the Catholic community for the migrant workers and all that, which we're still doing through ACME, through some uh, different ways of charities, yeah? Thanks, Hans, for picking, uh, m mentioning that. Do we have any other questions before we end off the session? We have 10 more minutes. Yes? Uh, it's really wonderful hearing what you are saying, especially now when you are in South building the Synodal Church. Yeah, the Synodal Church is now coming up. Um, no, I just want to say thank you to everyone here because it was really very informative. Um, for me, I mean, I'm interested to hear more about how to build a synodal church because I, I guess that's the next lab for us. And I was, actually, I was wondering whether today's session was actually recorded because I know a lot of people, you know, would have wanted to attend, but there's a limited number of um, people. Yeah, yeah it's being it's recorded. Because what I think Wendy and Arthur, you were saying, earlier, I, I think it's really quite in, uh, important for those of us to know our role, our mission, and that we all have a part to play and participate, taking it to the next step. Yeah. So thanks very much. Yeah. So when you go to the exhibition, make a pledge on what you can do. 
for the church. Yeah. 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 So um, about the Synodal Church, I'm sure many of you are already aware or becoming aware that the Archdiocese is preparing for the Synod of 2023. We may think why so far away. But uh, the Synod is a meeting of the worldwide bishops. Not all of them will attend, but the, the, they will be represented. And they will be talking about how to make the church more participatory, more uh, uh, collaborative, more um, uh, missionary. Yeah? So again, uh, it is trying to, trying to implement a theological understanding that among the baptized people of God, we are all endowed by the Holy Spirit with a gift. We are, we are familiar with the gifts of the Spirit. You know, some speak in tongues, some have uh, inspiration for prophecy and things like that. Uh, but those are given to individuals. However, a collective gift that is endowed upon the whole community of the baptized is the sense of the faithful. It is like a sixth sense. Yeah? A sixth sense, a religious ability to discern the voice of God to hear God speaking to the church. And the more we get together to do that, the more we are able to read uh, the will of God in our lives. And so the Synod is to try to promote uh, different ways of uh, church structures or church opportunities so that people can come together to meet and listen to one another. And so our diocese is preparing for that over the next uh, year or so in creating new structures, new platforms for people to be able to come together to talk about what matters in the church. And you will be invited eventually to attend these synod preparation sessions, either conducted by your parish or through some other church organization or whatever your connection is to the church. There will be, because these meetings will be running across the diocese and you can attend as many of them as you like and they are optional yeah and the feedback that we obtain from these meetings will be submitted up to rome in april uh, uh, for the benefit of the bishops to be able to get our feedback but the consultation the the togetherness the listening will continue on as a you can say that this will be a new permanent feature in the church from now on. That we are going to start saying, hey, the church is not just the religious, the church is not just the clergy, the church is not just the professional lay workers, the church is all of us. And so this new uh, approach to listening to one another will give you the opportunity to share your voice. And through your voice, hopefully, the Spirit's inspiration. Yeah? This sounds very much mm. like how our government does reach with discussion panels, together feedback. Yeah, yes. So in a way. Uh, but I think um, I just want to say that uh, Pope Francis, from his very first uh, document as Pope, has already given us a kind of a pastoral plan or a pastoral approach. Because as a priest himself and as a bishop, he often walked the streets of his diocese and met people where they were at. And I think when we say synodal, we are talking about a church that walks, walks with people. So the basic request of Pope Francis now is to ask the question, in what way are we walking with people? And who are the people left behind? Basically, he's not only interested in a meeting in 2023 with the bishops, he's interested in all of us learning, as Arthur says, to become synodal, to be people who continuously search and walk with people 
who need accompaniment, who need company, who need somebody to say something to them that will help them take another step forward, to get them out of their situation, whatever it might be. So the power of walking with people and listening to people is what Pope Francis wants us to experience. And in doing that then, with the whole church starts to change from being a church that's rather individualistic, whether it's an individual family or an individual person, rather than being that kind of church, coming to church for a mass and then going, that we become a church that walks together. You know, somebody was saying the other day, how is it that we need a ministry to have hospitality in our church? Must have a special ministry because people don't know how to greet each other. No, so we've forgotten how to walk with people. No, so th that's, I just wanted to say that the synodal process is that kind of walking together, listening. And I think that's very important, you know, because uh, I think one of the challenges that we are facing is we have got so used to good Catholic life means you got to belong to a church ministry. You got to belong to a parish ministry. <laughs> And I think this is doing us a lot of damage because we're getting more and more inward looking. Um, I think the real involvement is actually to walk, to walk together, as we walk together, to talk together. You know that beautiful image of Jesus joining the conversation of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Very beautiful. That's the kind of church. What are you talking about? What's happening? Why? And then getting the word of God in. Huh? Uh, he, he opened the word to them, and their hearts began to uh, jump in, and they got so excited, and they ran to announce the good news. I think that's the kind of walk. That's the kind of journey. That's the kind of life we need uh, of the church in Singapore today. And the more and more we move out of inward-looking ministries to outward-going uh, conversations about life and response to life, the more dynamic and vibrant will be our churches and our parishes. Well, I would like to insist on this question of Synod. You know, Vatican II was the madness of Pope John XXIII. That all men, he was 78, 79, who started with the council. At that time, there was 2,300 bishops to bring together. It was quite a job. And what came out is though the bishops assembled inside the church, they told us the church is outside. The church is outside. When I was parish priest in St. Teresa, people were asking me, where is St. Teresa? I say, you mean the building? I can't give you the address. <laughs> but St. Teresa is in Bukit Perme, in Spottiswood Park, in Depot Road, in Teloblanga. Wherever there are people, there is a church. Now, the, count, the synod is a madness of Pope Francis. In the world of today, now there are 5,300 bishops. There were 2,300 from Vatican II. Now there are 5,300. It's impossible to bring them together. It would be impossible to have a council as it was before. And now, not only that, but the Pope wants the whole world to be touched and the whole world to contribute. Now, it means one billion, two hundred million people for the Catholic Church. Now, it's all these people who have to be involved. And will the Pope see the end of it? Pope John XXIII did not see the end of Vatican II. 
And people said better, because he knew how to start it, he would not have known how to finish it. <laughs> so someone else had to finish it. Pope Francis has started, kicked. What will come out of it, we don't know. But we are challenged. The spirit is there. And we must be enthusiastic and tonic about it. You are still not enough people who are tonic about life, what who believe in life. That is important. I remember when I came, I met some of this old Chinese lady who every day were drinking some tonic, you know. <laughs> they were drinking vin carnish. And some of them were drinking brandy, you know. They needed a tonic. So we need to be tonic, and especially for this uh, uh, re for this work we are given now, this because there will be people who will be, oh, you're so much. No, 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 we have to go ahead. The spirit is the spirit of creativity. We must be creative. Amen. <laughs> I like that, what Father Aru said, that where there, is, where there is community, where there's people, there is the church. And so that's how we have to end off now because there's another talk going to happen. But thank you so much to my guests, Father Aru, Father Vaz, Wendy, Arthur. It's been very enlightening and I'm so proud to be part of this Discussion. Thank you for your time.